Are you struggling to invest in property this year and need help buying? Then you need to book in a consultation with Investor's Dream and let us do the hard work for you. Don't fall victim to missing out on incredible deals like everyone else. Lock in a meeting today. Go to investorsdream.com.au and secure your financial freedom today. Welcome to the Smart Property Investment Show with your host, Phil Tarrant. Hi, g'day. Hey, gang. Uh, welcome to the podcast today. I've been, uh, there's a lot of scuttlebutt going around waiting for this portfolio update. This is when we here at Smart Property Investment go through our portfolio, which has been a mainstay for how we've gone about growing out this great brand of Smart Property Investments over many, many years. Going a deep dive into a real world, real life, actual portfolio, not make believe, the real deal. And I'm uh, very fortunate that over many years I've been connecting in with some of the uh, key players in this market who are pretty good at building portfolios and I've been leveraging their capabilities, uh, mortgage brokers, accountants, conveyances, the whole kit and caboodle. One of them is our buyer's agent who is there from the very beginning who has supported us buying uh, properties across this whole portfolio. So uh, sort of every month or so, we're going to do a lot more of it moving forward. We try to get together, try and check in. Not a lot has happened. And if you've been tuning in with our portfolio, we haven't acquired anything for quite some time. So it's more of a um, tweaking, finessing, better maintenance of the portfolio as we move ahead so that when at a point in time we can capitalize on new acquisitions, we can do that. So today is very much just an update where we're at. Uh, I know a lot of you out there have been asking or thinking about We'd love to know the status quo of this portfolio, seeing that it's uh, gone through the ups and downs of the last years, and now it's definitely into the up. So uh, we've done a lot of work to try and calibrate the portfolio in this current market to give us a starting point for mapping and navigating uh, growth moving forward. Uh, over the last couple of years, it's been relatively stable. Some markets have been sort of performing quite well, some less so. So there's been largely equilibrium in it in terms of its debt position because we haven't extended that at all and its capital growth position because we haven't seen a considerable amount of growth. We've done some calibration around its cost or expense position. I'm not going to go into that today. What I really wanted to do is focus on just really reconnecting you all with where the portfolio is right now, what the different properties are, where they are in terms of a capital growth point of view, what growth we've seen so far since our last real valuation of it or marking the valuation of it, and then also a bit of an insights into the um, income generation side of things. So a bit of a, a catch up on where our rent position sits, uh, whether we can be tweaking them at all. So um, we're going to go a couple of different ways sort of over the next couple of months. Today, very much about capital growth. Next time we get together, we're going to get down into the mortgage position. So it's quite a lot of work happening right now to try and reset some of these interest rates. And I note that, and I'm not going to go into it too much today, that a lot of our fixed rate products are coming off fixed over the next coming period. So we'll be looking to calibrate those out into a much cheaper position. And then subsequent to that, we're going to do a full podcast on uh, the P&L position in this portfolio. And as you all know, uh, this portfolio costs us about thereabouts, including all costs, about 80000 90000 bucks a year, which includes some principal payments, which also includes some land tax components of it. We spend nearly 40000 bucks a year in land tax. So that sort of puts this portfolio into a bit of a negative position. So we're going to get into it at a P&L level. So hold on for that journey. Um, we're going to be a focus for that over the next coming months. But today, very much about setting the equity position of the portfolio through valuations. Joining me in the studio, Steve Waters. He's one of the directors at Right Property Group who've been formative in helping us build out this portfolio. He knows the market much better than me, so I draw on him to try and work out what these things are worth. But what's something worth? Beauty's in the eye beholder, isn't it, Steve? Absolutely, mate. Good to be back again. <laughs> I like good. what you mentioned earlier on around the ups and downs of being an investor or a landlord with the portfolio. And it certainly is. For any investor, you'll have great times, you'll have not so great times, whether that be re around repairs and maintenance mm. or you know, management problems, whatever it may be, it's never a lineal approach. It's just like any other business. Yeah, absolutely. And it is a business and you've got to think of this as a business. And what do you want to do in a business? You want to generate income from it, but you also want to increase value of it. So it is definitely a business. So the business of property, and we'll kick off to the point you made there, Steve, around uh, it's not always rose, beer, rose and skittles. beer and skittles or whatever you want to, whatever analogy you want to use out of it. But um, I feel as though, and you've been on the sort of, um, when I actually do jump in a car and drive somewhere, which isn't very often, I normally call you and if you're available and you've been at the end of uh, a couple of my rants recently, just about. What we actually do for the listener is 
I'll drive past one of the properties and I'll send you a photo without the address and I'll say, guess, yeah. and you'll do the same. And you actually did that on Friday night I, as I well. I did. I yeah. absolutely did. And um, it feels at the moment, Stephen, maybe you can give some sense to this, that I'm just up against it in terms of repairs and maintenance and headaches and stuff. Like everywhere I turn, there seems to be someone with their hand out asking you something fixed, someone saying, if you don't fix this right now, it's a health and safety issue. If you do not do this, it's a sewerage issue. Like it just feels as though – at the moment, and it's perception thing and it's cyclical, that my property managers aren't working for me. They're working on behalf of the tenant. And it just feels like I'm just palming out money all over the joint. Yeah, look, it's a tough one. The property manager's job, as we've talked about many times, is probably the worst and the hardest job mm-hmm. within the whole of the industry, in my opinion. And it takes a very special person and they run a very fine line of compliance on one hand, keeping a landlord happy at the other and mm-hmm. you know, relative consistent cash flow. But to do that, they need to make sure the property's in good repair, but also from a tenant's point of view. So it is a fine line and we'll go through seasons, if you will, where repairs and maintenance could be heavy. And sometimes you'll get nothing for many, many years, but it all comes down to, in my opinion, preventative maintenance Mm. and when to attack it so that it's a dollar today, potentially, and not five tomorrow. Yeah, it takes time to do that properly. And and to your point, my hat's off to the property managers we use and property managers right across the the country, um, it is a tough job, you know, particularly when you've got to deal with people like myself who are sometimes hard to get a hold of and, you know, tough to get decisions out of. But um, it's a tough job. Fortunately, now there's a lot of technology that helps them on their way. But fundamentally, their job is really sitting in between the tenant, the landlord, the tradesperson and themselves to make sure that as an asset manager, that the asset is actually doing what it needs to be doing. And, you know, I just feel like there's just a heap of problems right now that back to back to back, you know, I'm getting phone calls from some, I got a phone call the other day, see, from a council and say, we're pretty much going, get your gutters fixed. Uh, they're a hazard now and uh, there's a tree growing in the gutter. And I was like, oh, really? I, I, <laughs> there's I, I, a tree, I, there's a tree in the growing gutter, gutter. that's I good. But, but I sat there and I went, well, if, if the gutters are full of stuff, whose responsibility is it to fix it? Isn't it the person that lives there? No. Not like, at all. You yeah, you know, but where, where does it start and finish, right? Well, it, it's a good question because, yeah. yeah, you don't want someone on an extension ladder lent up against a house cleaning the gutters out. Mm. That's not the tenant's responsibility. Yeah. In short, however, to think of it this way, because as we mentioned earlier on, it is a business and every house is its individual business, maybe like a franchise, if you will. Yeah. And with every business, there is HR, there is OH&S and everything that goes around compliance of running a business and property is no different and we need to keep on top of it just that usually it comes at times when everyone else is hammering on the front door as well around the same subject yeah so uh, i need to you know get a bit more control over and i'm going to actually spend some time tomorrow just just listing all the things i've got to get sorted out right because if i find that if i don't know about it and haven't got some sense of order around it i feel like i'm not in control of it but as soon as i actually understand what needs to be done it gives me a process and a and a scheme to go away and just start chipping away getting stuff done so i need to regain control yeah you do but mm. you're also a little bit unique well maybe so whereas mm. you actually do know a front door from a hammer and so yeah. when people come to you with quotes your initial reaction always is this is too much yeah straight up because you do actually have an understanding whereas a lot of people wouldn't and on the surface, they'll take the first quote or maybe even the second quote with no real understanding around the cost structure. Because remember that at the end of the day, the property managers are not tradesmen. They're merely a conduit of information for you around a lot of different areas and repairs and maintenance is one. And so for them to push back for the most on a repair quote, there's no understanding behind that. And mm. you can't really expect them to either. And that's there's a real dichotomy because I get quotes in all the time. I go, too much, you don't need to do that. And they go, well, yes, you do. And we're not going to go out and get any more quotes because we've already spent too much time getting the quotes on this one. So you end up in this sort of cyclical environment where go and get another quote. No, there's no traders available. This is the only quote we can get. Go and get another quote. Or I don't think it actually requires that. We've got a place up in Central Coast now. And uh, I'm being told that it needs a whole new roof. And I'm going, well, no, it doesn't. Isn't it just getting some bloke up there with a silicon gun sort of sorting out some couple of holes and stuff? So where does the truth lie is the question. Uh, I think the truth lies in your understanding of the components mm. and, and that is the key to it. Now, not everybody is going to understand in that particular case how much a roof replacement would cost, yeah. whether it's necessary, where could the infiltration of water in this case be. But a lot of people also have the ability to lean on those that may steer them in the right direction yeah. as well. Yeah. And we're not, it's not a very cheap, so we're not talking about tap washers here at $30. We're talking 
circa fifteen odd thousand dollars. That's a big one hit of expenditure for something in this particular case. We believe is not necessary. Yeah. Anyway, so I'm working through that right now. We'll do another portfolio update on that. It's not really the focus of today's chat, but you could probably sense some of my frustration. And you sort of your relationship with your portfolio, Sam. You must have this. You've got a lot of property. Your relationship with your portfolio sort of uh, ebbs and flows. Sometimes you think it's great. Sometimes you think it's not worth having. Right? Where you just get frustrated with it. You just think, look, I'm just done with this. Sell the lot and get out of there. But um, it's know, always uh, only around one of two components. Mm. Not always for the most, and it's either around the cash flow position of it or the repairs and maintenance yeah, yeah. because we can become very disillusioned with our portfolio if we're not seeing growth but it's continually costing us a lot of money in and around repairs and maintenance or you know that negative cash flow component and as we've talked about before that's why most investors only hold on to those properties for around about five years yeah anyway so i feel a bit that way now how, how do you sort of keep yourself happy with your portfolio you're happy fundamentally happy with your portfolio yeah, yeah. oh look there's a few sort of perhaps non-performers in there, which we've discussed before from many years ago. Mm. I tend to just keep the cash flow tight and I am a bit of a control freak around its income and expenditure. So I am that person that will increase the rent where necessary because I feel like that's a win Mm. or if I can minimize repairs and maintenance and and negotiate those. It's another win there because at the end of the day, it's all coming out of my pocket. Yeah. Well, I don't want to turn this into a moan fest, so we're going to move on. We'll go to the break beforehand. We'll uh, we'll stay with us when we come back. We'll get into our... uh, Valuation position back in a moment. Whether you're a seasoned property investor or about to buy your first property, finding the right investment property to buy in 2021 isn't easy. Why do it alone when you could partner with award-winning buyer's agent, Paul Glossop? Over the last 10 years, Paul has helped hundreds of clients build multi-property portfolios. Paul's secret is finding off-market bargains that get snapped up before the general public even gets a sniff. Interested? Head to purepropertyinvestment.com today to schedule a strategy call with Paul Glossop. Welcome back, everyone. Phil Tarrant, host of the Smart Property Investment Show with Steve Waters, director, Right Property Group, chatting through the Smart Property Investment Portfolio. Now, top line, Steve, there is 17 properties and 18 revenue centers for this. Streams right? of income. Yeah, so one of them is a duplex, right? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 17, 17, 17 properties, 18 bits of income now. You've seen a lot of property portfolios. In the big scheme of things, is this a good one or a bad one? I might be a bit biased. Yeah, <laughs> but maybe. I, yeah. Look, I really like it because it is quite diverse mm. and there is multiple streams of income throughout different states as opposed to today where all areas are really going up. Yeah. Usually they don't. So it's a very, I'm going to call it safe portfolio. It is a safe portfolio. So New South Wales, Victoria and Queensland. So in uh, New South Wales, one, two, three, four, five, six seven properties there is one property in victoria and one two three four five six seven eight nine properties in queensland suburbs range from the western suburbs of sydney and i was spending the weekend well friday skulking around the western suburbs of sydney uh, st mary's mount druitt Wayland, Shalvey, you know the who's who's of the suburbs of the, the western stomping suburbs. ground yeah mate getting out there i like it out there and um in some ways, reconnecting with the environment. Where, and to be fair, I haven't really been out there very often recently. So it was nice to get out there and reconnect with these properties and, and have a nose around, see what's going on, get a look at them. And uh, it was quite a good experience to do that. And it was nice to see them. I haven't seen it for many, many years and they still look largely the same. Well, that's the beauty. Yeah. It, um, and for the listener who maybe is just tuning in for the first time, you've actually had a massive hands-on approach with the mm. New South Wales-based properties at the very least, where you were stripping them out, you were laying the turf, yeah. and it's been many years since you've gone back. And as you say, not much has changed. Perhaps the demographic is evolving. Yeah. But one thing is for sure is prices are certainly evolving as well. <laughs> you know, the one observation I'd make was that um, it looks the same and everything feels the same. That, that, like there was no noticeable difference in infrastructure or anything like that. However... The properties have all gone up at least twice in value, if not three times in value. That was a big difference. And I sort of, I sat there and I sort of thought, nothing's really changed around here except for the property prices. Yeah, it's I was a, trying to get, so I was trying to make some sense of that. But it's very, hard. you can't. At the mm. end of the day, I remember because my first property was out there many, many moons ago, twenty twenty, yeah. I think it was, or, or thereabouts. And to see what it's worth today, even me, sometimes I have trouble wrapping my head 
around the effect of just how well they've done. Yeah. But it's not a matter of – actually, I'll rephrase that. It's not as how well they've done. It's just consistent in lines with historical averages. I've just happened to own them for a greater period of time. Yeah. And that's where the magic is. Well, that's the magic of property. So um, it was good to do that and uh, and have a look around. It was nice to sort of realign myself with the portfolio and um, – you know, often because you're out there doing other things, you often forget about it. So it's, I think, to actually get that ground truth. So if you haven't seen your properties for a while, go and, go and have a look. Go get a feel for the place. Like, And I was sort of – I was driving around thinking, would I invest again in this area? Would I invest again? Would I buy that type of asset again? And, um, you know, I was looking at the place, North St Mary's, and we all know – and I spent quite a lot of time going, having a really good walk through St Mary's, as in downtown area and then to this property, uh, North St Mary's, where, where you probably could walk to the station if you really wanted to. You know, St Mary's High Street's quite an interesting place. Um, bits of it is hugely vibrant. Then, you know, you get right towards the end there by the train station. It looks pretty unloved. There's a lot of shops there which are shuttered up. But in the actual High Street proper, you've got brand new National Australia banks there. You know, all the banks are there. There's a vibrant sort of like mini little um, High Street. Well, it's quite a large High Street now. It's about 20 Chinese restaurants there, there's kebab shops, there's about four pizza shops, there's every single bit of food that you want to get. There's different types of supermarkets. There's you know, supermarkets geared towards the Indian community out there, the uh, Pacific Islander community out there. It's very vibrant. It's very changed vibrant very spot. much from 20 years ago, mm. you know, if, if you talk about that type of- Lots of relaxation parlours along there as well. <laughs> that, that, hasn't, <laughs> that hasn't changed. No, that hasn't changed. Um, and that's actually towards the end, towards the station side yeah, of yeah. it. But re- remember <laughs> that uh, yeah, some of those shops have been closed down because of the metro station. Yeah. Which is, you know, they've moved early mm. because those works are now under. So underway. what's going to happen there? They're, they're going to completely change- the- I think it'll completely change. It's the I think the first station on the way out to the Otropolis for yeah. the uh, for the airport, Badgerys Creek. And if you look anywhere where these the, where the metro lines are and these stations are, there's mm. it's been a dramatic effect. It's a major transport hub. Yeah. So um, if you haven't done it, get out there and reconnect with your portfolio. Uh, you know the ground truth. You eyeball the people. You get a real sentiment and feeling for you know what are the drivers of potential uh, capital growth. So um, out in the western suburbs where we are. North St Mary's, Mount Druitt, Cambridge Park. We're also down in the southwest as well, uh, places like uh, Ambervale. So good to get into it. Now, Steve, the total portfolio. So the last time we really shared these numbers, and you know, I guess the question to ask is how often should you revalue your portfolio? Do, should you be doing it on a weekly basis going, wee, I've just gone up a little bit? Or you know, I think we probably do it yearly-ish. You know, is that enough? Is that not too much? You know, because it's nice to count your chickens when – they're going up, right? But your portfolio doesn't always go up. So over the last couple of years, it's been pretty stagnant. It's been sideways yeah. and some a little bit of contraction as well. It's a good question, how often should you do it? I think that really depends on two things. One, your personality, yeah. firstly. And secondly, the approach that you've undertaken towards the individual property within that portfolio. So if you take Barry Street in Cambridge Park, mm. well, that would be worthwhile at that concept stage when we purchased it and renovated to see what the value is straight away. Yeah. But if it was something along the lines of Macorber Street, well, there's no need to visit that every six months. Yeah. So um, just whatever you feel comfortable with. So last time we did this and we shared it on uh, the Smart Property Investment Show, which probably nine months ago, maybe a year ago, and probably not too tight on numbers. It was more anecdotally smack bang in the middle of COVID when everyone was predicting 30% price drops. So not really prudent to try and reprice during that period of time until you got some sense of things. We now know subsequent to that that we're in the biggest bull run in property in probably, you know, 20 years, right? Would you say this is the, the – you've seen a number of cycles. Is this the maddest you've seen it? No. You've seen not. it madder? Yeah. It, uh, and I constantly see the narrative around that within the media saying, that, you know, this is the craziest market we've seen or the most rapid amount of growth we've seen in 30 years, and I just disagree. Yeah. As – if anyone's listened to the story, back when I first started, I had properties double in 12 months. Yeah. And that was in 2000, 2001, too. The good old days. Well, but in terms of what the narrative is today, that was a much more heady market, yeah. if you will. Yeah, it's crazy. So we've just, mine myself and Steve have just gone through, and Steve's done some homework for me. He's gone away and, and looked to try and get a real world sort of valuation of the 17 different properties in this portfolio. So how did you go about doing that, by the way? What, what's sort of – because it's horses for courses, right? You can get bank vows, you can get desktop vows, you can do market appraisals, you can get your 
real estate agents to give you what they think it's worth. So in terms of us coming up with the dollar value of each individual property and then subsequent to that, the total portfolio, what's the process we took? For us, it was about what it would sell for today because as you correctly mentioned, there's multiple different types of valuation. There's a book valuation yep. and that could be derived whether the valuer walks into it curbside or an automated valuation or mm. whether refer to it as a desktop valuation. I'm more of the let's be as accurate as we can at this moment in time. Mm. So these numbers are about if it was on the market today, what would they sell for and then just shade them slightly. But the important point is these numbers will change again in, in it could be eight months, it could be six months. They could be dramatically higher or we might see, I don't know, as an example, APRA pull the handbrake and we might see some of this rapid growth yeah, you know, fifteen percent in the last twenty percent, and some of them in the last twelve months, condense again. Yeah. So it's only this moment in time. So last time we spoke about this, we reckon it was about seven point six million bucks at the total valuation of portfolio. This was probably smack bang in the middle of uh, COVID nineteen. The debt position hasn't changed. Now we've done nothing with the debt position. We haven't refinanced to increase the debt. We haven't purchased anything. So a uh, little bit of P and I payments. A bit, in bit there. of P and I yeah. payments in there, but um, uh, the actual quantum of the debt. 5.010 million bucks. So current valuation, Steve, what we're determined as of April 2021. And, um, you know, maybe what we do and, you know, quarterly, six monthly, as we go through this period of time, we can actually map this growth. It might be a good way for people to actually understand when you have a bit of scale in a portfolio in different markets, you can actually see and get considered growth over time. Total valuation, thereabouts $8.030 million. And then with that particular debt position I spoke about, the total equity is $3,019,610. That's on the total debt of $5,010,389.21, which gives us an LVR position of 62%. So there's a number of ways a portfolio this can grow and evolve from here on in. And, and maybe let's touch on that now, Steve. If we didn't do anything, so if we kept our debt position as it is right now and we let this thing go through another market cycle with us holding on to uh, the property and the cost us to do that, and, and we'll go into that in another podcast, but sort of thereabouts, sort of up between 80 and 90,000 bucks a year, the valuation of this portfolio is going to go up and the debt position is largely going to stay the same. So this is where you see your increase in equity, which you can realise at a point in time when you want to. This is the magic of compound growth, as we all know mm. about, but especially over an extended period of time. Because remember, this all started with property number one, yeah, Mallee Street, which is some 300% more in value today. It's an amazing difference. Yes, there's been a little bit of luck. There's been some hard work, but the market will dictate to what the value is. And the longer that we hold it, the better it will do. Yeah. We just need to be in a position to be able to hold it, and that'll always come around cash flow. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll get into that. And there's a number of drivers and mechanisms we have to improve in the cash flow from an expense position. Part of them is mortgages. And as I said, we're going to go through another process to try and shave these mortgage rates off a little bit. So one thing we'll touch on today a little bit later is increasing the um, the cash position on it by increasing rents. And then again, that's in line with the marketplace. But let's go through some numbers, Steve based on how each of these different properties are tracking. I won't give the streets for them, but we'll just talk about the suburbs and, and what sort of property is. Uh, North St. Mary's, Steve, place that we bought quarter. Uh, it's on a corner block. Current valuation, two bedrooms, one bathroom, older sort of fibro type joint. Uh, you can go and check it. You can see it on smartpropertyinvestment.com.au. Built around 1960 or so. And remember ripping up the carpet there and finding the old uh, newspaper Real estate uh, clippings from it. Mm. Yeah, um, purchased for 215000 bucks. So this is North St. Mary's, which is going to be essentially um, key to uh, this sort of aerotropolis type transport hub. Total valuation now, $650,000. Purchased for 215000 bucks. Rent. 340 bucks a week, total debt on this $343,000, which we refinance a couple of times through the way to help grow out the rest of this portfolio. Total percentage of growth since purchase, 203%. It's not bad going, is it? It's exceptional. Mm. In fact, it's outperformed the average, which is something that we sh yeah, we can't count on because there will be a moment in time where it'll go sideways. It will get back to somewhere near its historical averages, but for the most, it's done its job and yeah. some. Yeah, and we've held that for nearing 10 years now, so 200% growth. So bought it for 215, now it's worth 650. You can't complain too much of that. If only no. you had a whole bunch of them, it'd be quite nice, which, you know, in some ways we do. Now, another property here, uh, 
just down the road. It's in Mount Druitt. This one's a little bit further away from the uh, the Westfields and the train station from one of the other properties you have. But at a stretch, you could easily walk it. Two bedroom, one bathroom in a block, which is four stories. Probably, oh, I'd say about 30, mm. 30 properties in a, a blonde brick on a main road. Large unit. Mentioned. Large unit, which is two bedders, a uh, two-bedder bathroom, plus a laundry, which I'm sure you could probably do something with if you want to add some value over time. Built about 1980. Purchased, Steve, for grand sum of 190000 Australian dollars. A today with a valuation, <laughs> 330000 which has probably come back a little bit from when we last valued it on this show at 360000 bucks. We're making um, 250 bucks a week rent out of this, which we've said is on the low side. But again, you know, growth on purchase is only 73%. Mm. Worthwhile? Well, for me, it is because yeah. it's a tool within the portfolio, which we can talk about a little bit later on. Yeah. So, you know, I think you find most investors who have got a portfolio this size have probably got a couple of assets like that in that. You know, over time, I'm happy we've got that property and it will continue to grow now. Uh, next property, two bedder, one bath. And a garage, uh, the one before also had a garage, but this has got a garage actually connected in to the property. Internal so access, it's yep. internal access into it, right on the road which fronts um, Westfields. So you walk to the station, walk to uh, Westfields, you walk to Hogs Breath Hotel and get yourself a steak and everything else that's around there. Hogs <laughs> Breath Hotel. Or Hogs Breath, whatever that steak joint <laughs> is. Uh, I was skulking around there, as I said the other day. This property we did, and, and if you've connected with smartpropertyinvestment.com.au, we did a huge story on this when we uh, renovated this property in the course of a weekend, so over a long weekend, uh, three days. Purchased for 179 grand. Today, Steve, worth $340,000. And we've sort of dialed that back a little bit from the three seventy that was probably worth prior. And we've seen this across a lot of the unit market, considering border shuts downs and flight towards more house-based assets. These are the ebbs and, this is the ebbs and flows of property, though. It's not, as we keep talking about, it's not a lineal approach. As long as the trajectory is up and it's within its own metrics – and the historical averages, then that's what we're looking for. This block is quite unique because we bought the entire block. This was a bulk deal, if you will. And when we talk about opposite Westfields, you could literally throw a stone and hit Westfields. Oh, yeah. You're there. You just walk, literally you walk across the road yeah. you're in the car park. So uh, it's a great location and you walk into the station, Mount Druid Station, it's getting, again, some upgrades to it. It's all happening out there. The upside to this too, which is of recent or relatively recent, is – potential height zoning changes for the future. And because we collectively control the block in this position, who knows what the future holds in terms of more density once yeah. again. And I think it will happen. And, and when you start seeing migration, we've had zero migration um, yeah. in Australia as a result of COVID-19. So imagine when the borders open. And this is essentially a lot of places where new migrants come and live in Australia, right? Like, you know, you've got specific communities out there in Mount Druitt, which attracts a lot of the new migrants coming into it. So I think these will do well once that sort of dynamic I think, happens. Yeah, once the international borders open, a lot of the yield on this from a gross point of view is bad. It's circa five, five and a half, might even be touching 6%, yeah. which is great in any other part of the world. I would expect once those borders open, and who knows when that is, that you'll see that absorption of vacancy that's closer into the city and put more pressure on these outer areas mm. because the infrastructure is here. It's already there. And I would expect if I just put my sort of, you know, lick the finger and put it up into the air for directional piece, I'm going to say that we'll see 10% income growth Okay, it's good in to the see. near future. So moving on, Ambervale, which is a suburb of Campbelltown, which is a hub uh, southwest of Sydney, probably about, oh, God, 50 Ks. Southwest of Sydney is Campbelltown. It's a regional centre in its own right. Uh, it's got some really uh, quite exclusive parts of Campbelltown and then there's some less exclusive parts of Campbelltown. So it's a microcosm of, of how most of Australia lives. Ambervale is probably middle-of-the-road type suburb of Campbelltown, I would say, Steve. This is a property we purchased on another corner where there is some upside potential for it at a point in time if you want to put a granny flat onto it. But uh, purchased for 252000 bucks in December 11th. So just to give some sense, those four properties that we have just gone through, so this one and the other three, August 11th, September 11th, October 11th, December 11th, we weren't messing around at that period of time in terms of acquisition, 252000 bucks Today, we're looking at 
grand with a debt of three hundred ninety two thousand dollars on it. So we reckon we've got a, had a bit of an uplift, Steve, on this property from the last sort of vowel at sort of six hundred thousand bucks. So do you reckon put it on the market today you get six fifty? I do. Yep. And if we look at a lot of these areas, in fact, if not all of them, especially the houses, a lot of these, if you put them on the market today, they'd be gone by the first open home. Yeah. That's the tempo of the market once again. And as I mentioned earlier on, whilst these are the values where we see them what they'd sell for today, it might be a different story in six months. More could be sideways. Yeah, absolutely. Now let's shift to uh, Cambridge Park. And this is another property that we done a huge coverage on smartpropertyinvestment.com. You go and check it out. We did a huge reno on it. We spent about 40 odd thousand bucks and pretty much turned it into one residence into two, but it's still a one residence thing. It just gives some options for, for people to potentially have a more of a hybrid living environment with some elderly parents, whatever, there's two kitchens, mm. all that sort of stuff. Now, when we bought this, you can go and listen to the story, 236000 bucks is what we paid for it, and the bank at the point in time wouldn't even lend us that much money because they thought the house was uninhabitable, so they only financed it off the um, the actual value of the land, so we had to sort of find some extra bucks and stuff. So bought 236 just before Christmas by memory way back when, uh, and uh, I think it was December – we bought it December 11. I think we got the keys in January 12. 750 grand today, Steve, which is sort of you know, not bad going considering sort of the last vow was sort of 690, 700,000. That's the tempo of the market. And this is a unique house because it does have that, I'm not going to call it dual living. Well, it is dual living, but without the dual income. So it's more for a larger separated family yeah. under the one roof, if you will. That particular area is very, very strong at the moment as is the Campbelltown and as is the St. Mary's regions for all the right reasons. And once again, just to backtrack a little bit, all of these had a purpose. There's a theme to this one needed the work, so it was an equity play on an instant scenario, as is was the Mount Druitt unit, so too was St. Mary's and Macawber as well. Yeah. And this is, you know, this is a great property. You go and check it out, smartpropertyinvestment.com. And I know we're getting through these numbers pretty quickly. This is what a lot of people like. What's it, what is it? What's it worth, et cetera. So it's all online as well. So go to smartpropertyinvestment.com. You can go to the Our Portfolio section and you can dig down into all these different properties now. So just on this one too, sorry, yeah. on Barry Street, we had in the same suburb two weeks ago, one of our buyer's agents was going to an open home. And on the Friday night, the real estate agent rang us up and said, don't bother coming to the open home. There is 200 registered people for that. Yeah. That's the tempo of that particular suburban market. So if moment. we're going to put this property on the market today, do you reckon another investor would probably buy it? That's the beauty of this property. It would mm. appeal to everybody. Yeah. The larger family or the investor looking for the return and the growth. Yeah. Okay. So that's all the, it's a lot of Western suburb stuff there, Steve. Let's have a chat about Berkeley Vale, which is in the Central Coast before we go to a break. Uh, this is another property that we did a big deep dive on smartpropertyinvestment.com.au. Uh, purchased uh, September 12 for 230 grand. Uh, it's got 355,000 bucks of debt on it now with a uh, valuation of 690. We've got that out. And even that's probably a bit conservative for that market up there, Ron. Right you can't buy a joint up there. At the no, moment. the Central Coast is on fire, as everybody would know at the moment. But once again, the plan for this property was – we took something that wasn't particularly attractive and we made it attractive and it was an instant equity gain mm. uh, in a shorter period of time. In fact, it may be on the website, there was also a challenged valuation on this straight was, afterwards as well, was. where there, I think there was some 20% difference overnight yes. or within a week. Well, yeah, fixed, I think we fixed the screen door and some paint splatters on the ground. And Correct. Because yeah. I think we tried to get the thing valued on Christmas Eve. Correct. Memory. That's what it was. And yeah, the guy, yeah. The guy just didn't want to be there, so he just he was in and out. So we recalibrated. That it was good. Stay with us. We'll go to a quick break when we come back. We'll go through some of these other portfolios. I don't think uh, properties. I don't think we're going to get through all of them with time, but um, we'll pick out a handful which are really interesting. Back in a moment. Are you ready to take your first steps towards financial freedom by investing in property? Maybe you've started your portfolio but need some help continuing to grow. Lachlan Vidler and the team at Atlas Property Group are here to help. As experts in property investment, Lachlan and his team are ready to help you take advantage of some of the best investing conditions in almost 20 years. By completing the research, sourcing and negotiations, Lachlan goes the extra mile to find you a high-performing investment and set you on your path to financial freedom. Book in your free discovery call today at atlaspropertygroup.com.au. Uh, welcome back, everyone. Phil Tarrant, host of the Smart Property Investment Show with Steve Waters, director, Right Property Group. Just going through some of the assets in this portfolio now, giving a bit of an idea of uplift in 
equity position before we get down a pathway of looking at mortgages and P&L type position in future uh, podcasts. Steve, there's a point here, there's a property here, which is dual in the uh, the smart property investment portfolio crown in terms of a valuation point of view. Mount Karingai, which is about sort of 45 minutes north of Sydney on the train line, sort of an owner-occupier type area. This five-bedroom property, which has had a fair bit of work done on it over the time, purchased back in March 13 for the grand total of 665000 bucks. Today, $1.250 million. Hard to even put a valuation on that one, right? It's it is quite anomaly. unique. Yeah. yeah. But the area is, it's a very strong area in terms of its uniqueness. It's also its location, but also because it is one of those areas that has minimal land available. Anything that's left, anything that builds, is a brand new build today is consequence of a knockdown rebuild. Mm. And so anyone buying into this area to do so at circa 1.2, 1.3 knows they're going to have to bowl the house over to build that McMansion and that area dictates that it's worth doing so in the medium term. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, some other assets here, Steve, when now we move to Queensland, some places there at Loganshire and, and Springfield. Go to the website, you can check these ones out. They'll all be there with photos and, and all the information. Uh, we've had some okay growth in that, particularly the one in Springfield. Uh, we reckon up to about four sixty thousand, which is all right. But just the property here, I wanted to highlight back in New South Wales, Steve, Port Kembla. So we've done again some good stories on this at smartpropertyinvestment.com.au. Two townhouses, both two bedrooms, one bathroom. I wouldn't say the most glamorous properties in Port Kembla, but it's on a street which fronts a park, which fronts the beach. Mm-hmm. Uh, that whole area is being gentrified. This is also one of those properties impossible really to get a vowel on. Uh, we purchased for three twenty. We're sort of indicating sort of a seven twenty uh, valuation now with four hundred fourteen thousand bucks worth of debt on it. We could probably uplift the rent a little bit by both of them for twenty bucks a month. Another tough one to vowel. It is, and it's because of its just how unique it is. There are not too many ready made dual income properties anywhere, let alone you know, Port Kembla or the Illawarra for that matter. Yeah. You go further south, so further away, where a standard three bedroom in a pretty ordinary street is selling for six hundred and fifty thousand. Mm. So the market is very, very warm there as well. But this one has all the upside of potential water views, its location. And I'll say gentrifying area, but it's probably not the right terminology for it. Yeah, and it's done its job. Oh, it's done really well. That great capital growth and. Largely hasn't been a headache, you know, in terms of maintenance, little bits and bobs. I think I had to change the wiring up and get a new switchboard and stuff because it's a bit old. But other than that, it's been a consistent performer. Uh, some other properties there. There's one we've spoken about beforehand in Kingston, which we had to do a whole bunch of work on. If you go and listen to the last portfolio update, really get into that. But the other real sort of asset here, which is, again, a little bit of an anomaly in this portfolio, but the sort of stuff that a lot of investors want, it's a block of five units. In Launton, again, smartpointinvestment.com to you. Go and check it out. We've done some stories on it. Another tough one to Val, Steve. We bought each of these, I think the whole five, you know, it's all strata as well, but we bought five of them from one owner for a million bucks back in October 17. So even that's sort of gearing up to four years ago now. We've got a Val on each of them at 225,000 bucks. So we've seen a bit of growth uh, in that over time. But this, again, something you can hold on to. And I think we've had it tenanted every single one of them. You know, without too much of a gap through the whole time. We've I think had you've maybe had a week three, here, a week, a week there. Three phone calls since yeah. since you've owned it. Really good property manager up there as well, Peter it, Real Estate. And this is, I mentioned earlier on about every property needs a reason for being there. And this is mm. a tool. We all knew what was going on for the future in the area, in and around the university affordability. This is a zoned play as well with future purpose, but multiple streams of income to help underpin some of the other properties, mm. which are a little bit negative and have the growth component on top. They would certainly benefit from a cosmetic renovation, but there's no reason to do it now. It's not a necessity. Cash flow position on them is very, very good. Trying to value them is near impossible because there's nothing else there like it really yeah. for sale, nor has there been in the recent future and the recent past. And I think there's a very, very good chance that we could increase its cash flow position immediately, as in yesterday. And that's what we'll talk about next time we get together. Um, and from a sort of upside potential, it's easily walking distance to the station. It's probably one or two minutes to actually get to the train station there at Launton. Mm. We all know, know, all know Launton is the suburb before 
Petrie, and that's where the new university campus is in there. So at a point in time, whether we do it in a cycle or we sell it and someone else does it, you can knock that thing down once height restrictions change again there. It's already sort of medium density. But, but that's not the time, reason we bought it. We didn't buy it for the you know, potential height adjustments. It was based on its merit at that yeah. point in time. Yeah. So um, you never know. You know, you might be able to put 20 units on that at a point in time or 30 units, who knows. And uh, Well, you're we, controlling we the that, opportunity now. controlling the opportunity. Yeah. It's actual park as well, so it's nice, quite a nice setting. But uh, At the, zero cost, isn't it? At yeah, zero cost. About, yeah. yeah, yeah. They're actually good performers. Our Queensland-based stuff performs better from a cash position than our New South Wales stuff because we're not getting hammered with land tax in the Queensland. Yield, and, and The yields yeah, are better. The yields are better. And as long as you structure things the right way, because we have different Queensland properties in different trusts, and you can have so many properties in trust in Queensland where they're having to pay land tax. So um, That's a good point because for the listener and the reader on the website, mm. you will notice the complexity of ownership, if you will, around the portfolio, and that has a cost to it. Yeah, it has a good cost. And we sort of sit there and go, well, if we took that cost away, if we had in a different structure, if we took that cost away, the portfolio starts to look a lot better. We'll do this when we get to a P&L discussion around it, but- you know, we still need to carry this portfolio to a tune of like 1800 bucks a week. And that's in, fact. And that's fact in yeah. negative cash flow, right, before tax. Pre-tax. Like obviously it all washes out and stuff, but you've got to be able to carry it, right? Like that's a lot of money, 800 bucks. It's a hell of a lot of money. And, you know, as we'll talk about in a subsequent podcast, there is some immediate adjustments which could alleviate a Get lot of that it. cash flow. Yep. Yeah, so it's good. So um, top line, so that's uh, just over eight million bucks in valuation. So I'm, I'm pretty happy with that. Uh, Five million bucks with the debt, so three hundred uh, three million dollars in equity. And now that's as, as a base portfolio. Uh, hold that for a couple of cycles. Should be okay. It'll be more than okay. It's doing all right now. And I think <laughs> once again, that's the whole point of it is to control it over a period of time. It has been circa ten years. Mm. Ten years since yeah. we first started, and it's tracking well. Yeah, it's good. Well, thanks, Steve. That was really good to do. That that was just a chance for us to reset the discussion around uh, the Smart Property Investment Portfolio. Now we can get into some of the meat around it. If you've got any questions at all, obviously a lot of numbers there, you're going to go, oh, what just happened? Uh, It's all on the website, smartpropertyinvestment.com.au. Go and check it out. And we're really improving this part of the website as well. So you can have a better engagement and interaction with the Smart Property Investment Portfolio. Any questions at all, happy to answer them. Editor at smartpropertyinvestment.com.au is where you need to email. That goes to the team and I'll make sure I get that. Me and Steve can answer it live on air. And don't ask anything that you think is silly. Just ask ask away. It could be whatever it is, you know, any questions whatsoever. But I guess the base principle of this portfolio is that it is a real portfolio, warts and all. We cover every single – you've seen the numbers, Steve. Every single expense is in there. So it's a real-world portfolio. It is. It's as real as you will get and some, as you've mentioned before, with your 12-foot-long spreadsheet. Mm. There's just about everything that you need in it, maybe some of the other adjustments to be more personal for other people. And I think you've asked before, if you've said before, whoever wants the – the, sheet. the template. Yeah, you can do that. I, I did that uh, last time around. I got in trouble from the team you broke, because yeah, nearly you broke, broke the, the internet. internet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but look, I'm happy to share the template for this particular spreadsheet if you don't have one. And, you know, maybe this is a little bit too much for some people, but if you want this sheet in the Excel template, email the team editor at smartpropertyinvestment.com.au. Happy to share that with you and subscribe you as part of it to smartpropertyinvestment.com.au. So get in touch with them. I'm probably going to get in trouble for that, but anyway, I can sort of handle that. Uh, Steve, thanks for your time today, mate. (laughs) Good to be back. It's good. It feels like we've been at that. That's 40 minutes and it feels like we've just begun. So conscious that we've got to do Mm. more of it, which is good, but I appreciate your time and your insights on this. And thanks for going through uh, the process of helping me um, uh, price this properly with valuation point of view. Keep checked in, keep dialed in, smartpropertyinvestment.com.au, portfolio update where it's at. Remember, any questions, editor at smartpropertyinvestment.com.au. And please leave some feedback wherever you're listening to this on whatever podcast player it is. Uh, It's just not myself. Here's a big team that really get behind uh, helping property investors be better informed through smartpropertyinvestment.com.au. So uh, let us know what you think we're doing, anything we can do to improve. Uh, Hope you enjoy that. We'll be back again next time. Until then, bye-bye. The information featured in this podcast is general in nature and does not take into consideration your financial situation or individual needs and should not be relied upon. Before making any investment, insurance, tax, property, or financial planning decision, you should consult a licensed professional who can advise whether your decision is appropriate for you. Guests appearing on this podcast may have a commercial relationship with the companies mentioned.